What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Happness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Dave Klein, and we unpack the essentials of building high-performance teams and watch out, this is another episode speaking about cultivating effective leadership. So we really speak about what leaders and managers can do better to create a sense of psychological safety and hence a higher performance in their teams. And we peel the onion, what it takes to have a culture of speaking up and speaking the truth and making it personal so the entire team can learn from mistakes and from each other in a genuine and in a safe way. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand, take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And there you'll also find a link to the Academy if you want to work on your own facilitation and leadership skills. Check out our live online courses. And now, enjoy the show. Hi, Dave. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Miriam. Thrilled to be here. Yeah, very excited. And I always start with the same question. Okay. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? Actually, do you? I've actually never called myself a facilitator. It's interesting. I, I coach one-on-one. -on -one. I do keynote speaking. We run a program with leaders. And I recognize that I do a tremendous amount of facilitation, but I would have never called myself that. Part of it's a very conscious choice. Like I don't think many people, in terms of my target market, I don't think they wake up in the morning and think, you know, the thing that I'm missing is a facilitator. <laughs> I think instead they think, I really wish I had a coach who'd been through this before, or I really wish I had had training. So I think we tend to try to go more towards what are those moments that managers think of when a third party can be helpful to them. And then facilitation is rather a tool that you use to help your clients accomplish whatever goal they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, um, I don't know, I tend to think oftentimes that if we can help people articulate a destination, right? Part of the times people can't get where they're going because they don't know where that is. But if you can help them paint a picture of what good looks like and then come back to the present and say like, okay, where am I now? And then what are the impediments or what are the experiences I have to collect to go from here to there? Yeah. And I can't tell them what the right destination is. It doesn't really matter what I think about their current state. And then together, if we articulate, like I'm going to draw those out from people you know, through facilitation, then we can start to have a conversation about the obstacles. And maybe that's where some of my expertise or nudging or questions will help smooth the path. Yeah, beautiful. And yeah, and sometimes we don't need the explicit label if it's more disturbing or confusing. So where did you pick up the skills that help you to facilitate or to work with group, to train, to coach? I honestly picked it up a bit by accident. Actually, I hadn't really thought about it. Like I, I would say probably from two different things. So one, I would have said a lot of my formative years came on the field. So I grew up playing sports. And so it felt very natural to me to have a coach, right? To have someone in mm -hmm. my life who's challenging you to be better, who's holding you accountable to showing up, who's asking you, you know, sort of what your goals are, seeing potential, et cetera. So I think that was probably one piece that was foundational. And then the other is, Luckily, I started leading teams very early in my career. I started a consulting, but very quickly I had a team. And so really for 23 of the 24 years I was in the workforce post-university, I was running teams. And admittedly, early on, I don't think I was very good at it. And I think that was because I thought my job was to have the answers, not ask good questions. My job was to provide the direction, not sort of get everybody to collaborate on what the direction should be. Mm -hmm. And so I think you sort of accidentally iterate into, oh, facilitating people to get somewhere is a much faster way to get there, even if it's a little bit of a bigger investment up front than simply telling them what the answer is. So I think probably those two influences led me there. I think it's beautiful that you then realize that, oh, actually asking them questions <laughs> instead of telling them might be more efficient. And then I wonder, it sounds so easy when you say that, oh, I learned from sports and had a coach and then I realized that I was doing the wrong thing and then I recalibrated and then it worked. 
Well, it's very easy for me to say in a 20 second soundbite, that second recalibration part was probably five to seven years of screwing it up and kind of, you know, kind of running into the glass wall that I thought was a door. And then finally being like, oh, if I just go around, that'll be the faster way. So, <laughs> Yeah. And it reminds me of this story in coaching that you first, you walk down the street, you see the hole, you fall into the hole. The second time you see the hole, you remember the hole, you still fall in. Third time. You try to walk around it and you still fall in. And I think that from what I hear is you recognized you took the time to really build the self-awareness and then the skills. And this, then I assume, now makes you good in coaching or training teams to become this high performance team. So maybe even managers to become more of the leaders or the facilitative leaders instead of the micromanagers. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the most important things a leader or a high-performing team can do to really make the shift? How can someone avoid the glass door? That's good. As you were saying the coaching axiom, I was thinking, oh, there's like a fourth and a fifth, right? You go down the street, you see the hole, you know you have to build the bridge over it, you build the bridge, and then the bridge collapses back into the hole. And then the fifth one is you're walking down the street and you brought someone with you and you warn them about the hole, uh, you know, <laughs> and they go around it and then you fall into it anyways. Like somehow, even <laughs> the things I'm coaching, I turn around and look at my own business sometimes and I'm like, oh my gosh, you're like literally doing the thing you coach your clients not to do. Like, wake up. Oh, yeah. The shoemaker's wearing the worst shoes, right? <laughs> exactly. And I see that, yeah. And I remind myself being the coach, the facilitator, and then forgetting to ask any questions when we're in a private <laughs> context. Um, but to your question, I think, you know, how do you get to become good at that? You know, I think I can mostly speak to my experience. And I think it happened really in the second half of my career. And now that I sort of gain that skill, I can pattern match and be like, oh, what a shock. When you look at high-performing teams, they all seem to do this. And so I would say two of them, and they, I think they're paired together. One of them is a ritual around um, reviewing performance. So for me, I think I, my eyes were opened up to it in my years at Bridgewater, where we had this process called diagnosis. And it was six questions that somebody facilitated a group through whenever something went wrong. And that ritual, and I, and I use that word intentionally, it was easier for everybody to sort of keep a logical mind space because it was, we did the same thing every time. We always knew the six questions. Mm -hmm. It was expected that if something went wrong, we would bring the group together and go through that. And so I learned, you know, and that teaches you lots of sub things that I think are helpful, active listening and probing, et cetera. And then you zoom out and you look at other organizations and you're like, oh, the special forces, every time they run a mission, They do an after action review. Oh, sports teams. Every time they play a match, or play a game, the next day they watch the game film and figure out how do they get better. And you start to see that pattern of reviewing performance as a ritual as part one. I think the other one you see is extremely candid feedback. Mm -hmm. That if you have a shared mission, having a machine where everybody is providing mutual accountability and calling out the wins so we repeat them and calling out the deficits so we can improve upon them. If you have that entire mm. ecosystem thriving, then that also sort of allows us to go after really big, ambitious outcomes successfully. So I think those were the two yeah. that help, I think. Thank you for sharing that. I would be curious what you've learned from your time at Bridgewater as well, where which is really known for meritocracy. So it is about the candid feedback, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But also when I hear the, about the six questions or the retrospective it also reminds me then of the of this little story where it's okay so you have the retrospective you know what went wrong and then you fall into the <laughs> hole again and then what how do you at the same time create the safe space where you can have these candid feedback conversation that oh you fell into the hole again mm -hmm. while really learning from mistakes and getting better or is it keep the team for high performance mm -hmm. Well, I think if you, I would say split the two things, right? It's like one, how do you create the environment where everybody is trusting enough to be candid? And then mm -hmm. two, was there something we did differently in our retrospectives that allowed, allowed us to skip all five versions of the falling in the whole story that you fall into it once and then you learn from it? I'll take them in reverse order. I think on that latter one, the entire goal, like it, 
at some level, our facilitated process was nothing more than the five whys, right? Ask why until you mm-hmm. get to the root cause. But I think the main difference and probably the meaningful one that answers the question is for a lot of people, they intentionally stay anonymized and they stay in the process. And for us, we wouldn't want to ask why until it switched from the process sort of magically happening to, well, who made what choice that caused that? Because that answer then tells you, well, who should do what differently? So sometimes that could be somebody in a process skips a step. So it's very easy. Mm -hmm. The who should do what differently is that person should not skip the agreed upon step. Sometimes everybody's following the process and the process was poorly designed. Okay, the who should do what differently is the person who designed it should design a better process. Or everyone in the process understands it but isn't trained. Okay, well, the who should do what differently is you know either change the training or deliver the training, et cetera. And that one minor difference I think is important because when we leave it anonymized and we say like, oh, the process broke, nobody knows what to do differently. Blame the process. Right. And everyone so, was so we all feel good because we're protected. You know, we didn't we didn't yeah. shoulder the blame. But without the answer to that, then you shouldn't be surprised that because no one knew what to do differently, they all fell back in the hole again. There's no accountability, no responsibility. Right. And no yeah. real no clarity, right? At the end of the day, all of these machines, all of these processes, they can be implicit or they can be explicit. But it's just people using technology to achieve an outcome through a series of steps. They can be all the steps and technology that they imagined and just are doing common sense things, or they can be, you know, systemized, written down and programmed out and everything in between. But again, if you don't answer the who side of that, I would bet against you not repeating the same mistake. Fascinating. And the who is where it gets dangerous. Most teams, and then this comes to your second part of the psychological safety, right? Right. And so it's like, how do you build an environment where it is okay To be honest, and again, we're not trying to pin blame. We're trying to, I love the game tape analogy, right? It's the game happened yesterday. We're now rewatching the film. Obviously, whatever we did didn't work or we would have won. Or maybe we won by a little, but we could still build upon that and improve. And so we're not trying to blame the person. We're trying to say, oh, you need to be better positioned here. We should have run a different play there. Uh, we weren't prepared for this thing that they surprised us with. Let's not let those things happen again. Here's who's going to do what differently for that to be true. So what do all those teams have in common, right? How do they create psychological safety in your world? I think, again, this isn't, all, this isn't like binary. I think we're all aspiring towards having this mix. I think one of them is having a shared purpose. Like, I think sometimes we get surprised that we bring people together who aren't really aligned to the mission, who don't really care about the outcome. To some degree, they're not going to, that's not going to compel them to move through a little bit of the discomfort that mm-hmm. comes with this level of truth. Like what comes with being that candid with each other. And so having a shared purpose then says, oh, it's hard, but it's supposed to be hard. And I'm okay with that. Like, I know that this mm-hmm. is going to make me better. It's like a personal trainer. It's going to the gym. So just quick um, clarification. Mm-hmm. So what I hear is that one main requirement is to have a growth mindset within the members of the team. I think that's probably, I was going to say, I, one is the shared purpose. Then I think the next is going to be, you can call it a growth mindset. You can call it curiosity in Bridgewater terms. Since that's where we started, we would have called it being assertive and open-minded at the same time, right? Like people who mm-hmm. independently had a point of view, but were open-minded enough to know that they were probably wrong and could take in different input to improve the quality of that independent view. Um, so, yeah. so some mechanism for self-improvement, for growth. If you believe you know it all and you're fixed, it's going to be a pretty useless process to diagnose and give you feedback on how to get better. So you need to be able to metabolize that in some way. Yeah. And it all sounds so easy if you have the right people in place and if you have this culture. Mm -hmm. And I wonder to what extent can you help a team build that culture within, or do you need the entire company culture to be already there? Uh, I think and then to what extent is a hen on an egg? I think you can build it. But again, the reason I start with, do you have the right people with a shared purpose is it's easier if you do. And a lot of people skip that part and they have people who are underperforming, who aren't mission aligned. And then they start giving feedback and they're like, why doesn't it work? And I'm like, well, Well, you have people who are have fixed mindsets who don't care about your mission. Like you shouldn't be surprised. This is the outcome. Um, I don't think you need the entire culture to necessarily embrace that. I think you can do it even within a small team. 
But again, you have to create the safety, right? Like a, another ingredient, I think, is the leader has to really embody the type of environment you're talking about. So if you're going to ask people to be candid and be vulnerable, you need to be candid mm -hmm. and be vulnerable, right? If they know you're holding back on delivering feedback, they're going to hold back. Or if you're not able to self-assess and say, this is where I screwed up. This is, I came up short on these two. Hey, this one I own, then how can you expect them yeah. to do it? Makes total sense. And to what extent do you think there is an external person coming in to really help facilitate this process and build this culture? Or is it rather done from within? I'm like of two minds. And so in the same way, I'm like, oh, I could, I would say if it could just be created organically, but within the team, that's probably your best possibility, right? If, mm -hmm. if you had a leader who had that sort of vision for the culture, you had a team who was aligned to it, the right crew, the right, to some degree, I think they're going to they're going to live the story that they help write more than the story that gets handed to them by an outside script writer. Like to some degree, a facilitator is like a ghost writer. Like you're coming in and like helping give them operating system. So I think if you could do it without the facilitator, great. I think that, that when I said I'm of two minds, I think that's the minority. Like I think that a mm -hmm. lot of people, if they knew how to do it, if they knew what the script was and they knew what the operating system was, they already would have done it in the first bucket. And therefore they don't. And so then you have a choice. And I, I love this. I forget where I heard it, but it's like you pay for your ignorance in either time or money, but either way you pay for your ignorance. I love that. And so uh -huh. in this version, right, if I'm paying for it in time, I don't know what that operating system is. I don't know how to build that culture. And so I'm just going to guess and try to figure it out and iterate to it. And if I'm a smart leader with a good team, I'll iterate to it eventually. Or I can pay for it with money, right? I can bring in a facilitator, a trainer, a coach. I can get a book. Like, there's lots of different levels of money that adds this operating system in. And that's going to accelerate your timeline. And so yeah. I think that would be, again, ideal without it. But I think that's pretty rare. And so for me, I've gone through this transition in my career where I would very much want to pay for it with time. And then I started to realize the value of compounding. And so the earlier I get that operating system, the earlier we have a culture of being able to look back dispassionately at our performance and improve upon it. And the faster my team accelerates and therefore it's probably a good investment if that compounding gets started early. Yeah. And it's fascinating because I can, I can perfectly see how the time component can actually create bonding and growth for the team and the leader. Mm -hmm. Thinking back to your glass door, glass door experiment, right? Mm -hmm. That if you had maybe had, a coach early on telling you exactly what to do, writing you the script, you might have accelerated faster to become the leader that you were at the end, but maybe with less compassion and less stories to tell and teach others. And maybe you wouldn't be the coach that you are today, helping others to become that. Yeah. And still many teams don't have the time to go through that. And on the other hand, I think that also, there are many teams and team leaders, they see that something goes wrong and they cannot pinpoint it because there's so much in the system and maybe they've never seen a different way of management or trust or talking about who made the mistake without the blame. Yeah. I think that the who and the blame are so, and maybe even the shame are so two sides of the same coin. I think that's how most of us grew up, actually. And to get this out of the system, you actually have to untrain them a learn behavior. Yeah, it reminds me. Um, so I grew up, my wife and I grew up in a small town in upstate New York. And, you know, none of none of my family had really gone to university. And I, I had pretty good grades, I got into a good school. And That was sort of the first time, like being out of a small town and sort of all of a sudden the world presented like a new possibility set, right? That things that I thought were possible went from this to this. And then I moved to New York City and got a job at a big consulting firm. And the same thing happened again. The possibilities went from this to this. And the same thing to a Fortune 500 company, the possibilities grew. And then to Bridgewater, the possibilities grew. And it just resonates for me a lot, which is... It's the similar to when um, Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile. Like it was an impossibility because no one had ever mm -hmm. seen it before. Then it happens and 16 people do it in the next three months. All of a sudden, because someone just showed it could be done. And so I think that's the same concept, right? That if 
the, the, one of the advantages when we started our program a couple of years ago, we thought it was going to be exclusively for new managers. It was, it was, it was originally called the new manager accelerator and 65, 75% of the people who applied for the first program had five to 10 years experience. And we were so confused that we told them, we told them all, no, we're like, we won't let you in the program unless you talk to us because we don't want you to be disappointed. This is a, a this is like a foundational, you know, jumpstart for new managers and almost everyone that we talked to, we talked to like 25 of them. They said almost to a word what you just described. I've never had a good role model. I've never seen a functioning culture. I've never, you know, and to some degree, what they were buying was just being exposed to a different model, even if it wasn't fully yeah. for them and they, they, couldn't, they couldn't or wouldn't adopt the whole thing. They could take pieces and their possibility set went from this to this. And so that was a, that was a huge surprise for us being, you know, novice facilitators, you know, being novice coaches, um, that there was not much yeah. value in just exposing them to what good looks like. And it makes me, it makes me so sad somehow that um, this is where, yeah, experienced managers feel themselves and still gives me hope that they have the humility to apply for a new manager's program because apparently they see this gap. So there is lots of hope. <laughs> Exactly. And it, we're in the same boat. I am simultaneously horrified that 60% of all managers fail from the frontline managers to middle management to the C-suite. And yet we take our best people and we promote them to be managers. We know mm -hmm. that we should bring teams together because we can accomplish more than we can apart. And yet it's worse than a coin flip. Like that you're, you're literally describing why we got into the business we got into. And I guess the upside to 60% is we have a very big addressable market. Uh, that needs a little bit of help. Yeah. And then I love what you say about the, you see opportunities or you are in a new context and then suddenly your, your vision expands what becomes possible. And it, two stories come to my mind. One is a gif, I think of this dog who, who used to be um, in front of a door and could not go through. And then suddenly the door disappears and the dog could go through but doesn't, mm -hmm. although the owner shows it, how it could be, but it doesn't work. And I have run, I think my entire life, 10 kilometers or maximum one hour. Mm -hmm. And then I had a partner and they asked me, so why don't you run more? I'm like, well, I cannot. Have you ever tried? Oh, no. <laughs> and now I've completed several half marathons. <laughs> That you can. And 10 kilometers is actually the minimum I run. So it's amazing. It's funny how, how you explain it and how we are all, and I would consider myself having a growth mindset mm -hmm. and still I was trapped in this limiting belief. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a good reminder. And I think to come back to the external, to have someone to show what's possible and then to create this context within a group. Mm -hmm. When you're in a training, how does it feel if suddenly we speak openly with each other? How does it feel if we receive candid feedback, although it might be, it might hurt, but it comes from a good place. And for me, what you explained, this is where facilitation comes in to create an experience for the group that has a potential to be transformative in a way that they will perform differently afterwards. Mm -hmm. And... Hmm. I remember the different question that I had. Um, okay. I would pull that out. Because what happens now more and more in large organizations is that they have the more agile approach to working. So they are not simply intact teams, but teams work together in different teams with different managers, try to have a less hierarchical mm -hmm. approach, which then could make it even more difficult to find the shared purpose of a team or this culture of supporting each other. How do you approach that? What is the difference in creating high-performing teams or, or more safety, which is a prerequisite? I think you're probably right that it's more difficult, but I would argue that that then goes hand in hand with being even more important. So again, I, I don't know that the moves are all that different. Like in organizations that are agile and constantly forming and reforming teams, I would say the headline danger that I think the, you know, usually it's the manager has some point of view or the person responsible for the project has some input on who's going to be on that team. Again, I think that oftentimes 
it goes wrong because they're too passive. They're like, oh, this is just who I was told to take versus this is helping shape who I need to achieve the outcome you'd like me to achieve. Right. So being more proactive about the right set of people in that group, maybe then you're starting to think about other things like, have you worked with some subset of them before? So do you start with a nucleus of people who already have some trust and they can draw in the new people? Do they have that more natural alignment to the culture? Do they have the complementary capabilities? And then I think you can just use the early stages, you know, to accelerate through the old like storming, norming, performing stuff. But what I find one of the things I try to do is, is encourage leaders to be very explicit, right? Again, you sort of bring that team together and you're like, they'll figure it out. And instead, like, why not invest an hour or two up front? Can we look at each person and say, well, what are their strengths and weaknesses and what are they like? How do they like to engage? Mm-hmm. I wrote a piece about a personal user manual. It, it has like 15, <laughs> it has 15 prompts that you could go through and answer. And that could be a way to share so that you just quickly go from strangers to raised awareness about what each other are like, at least in a work context. You know, another one is to say, well, what are our operating principles? Like if you want people to be candid, if you want to have game film, if you want to have a ritual, like just can you write that down and say like, this is, can we agree to start our project or start our team operating in these ways by these norms? And again, help allow them to co-author that operating system again, as a way to feel like they had influence and are part of the, that creation and then do it, like do it and just make it normal. I think a, a capability that people all control and yet most underutilize is just being consistent. We talk about it with the leaders we work with all the time that the two parts of your brain, like the lizard part of your brain is constantly scanning for anything out of the norm, like anything that is erratic. And it, that's the part that then turns on the, should I run from this erratic thing that might eat me? And as much as we'd like to believe we can t- keep that turned off, it's very hard. And so the way that we as leaders can at least try to avoid triggering that is to just say that this is what we do, right? If we're going to give feedback in a Friday session every week, then that's what we do. If after every mission, we do an after action review, that's just what we do, you know? And it doesn't become this heightened thing that came out of the nowhere, or my boss didn't ignore me for two months and then all of a sudden show up with a whole boatload of feedback. It was just, you know, steady as part of how we do business. Reminds me of predictability and certainty to be the building blocks for trust and also performance because we we are less trust if we know that something is predictable and we know how things work i think people get the certainty one wrong a lot though don't you what do you mean at least i see this in the workplace which is for the most part value is doing things that people haven't done before if it was super easy and obvious and had been done before Now a computer does it or someone does it cheaper or, you know, it becomes a commodity. And so the thing that we're really being rewarded for is the novel, the different, the challenging, the undone. Well, that's super hard to make predictable, right? Incredibly hard. And so then people get frustrated because they're like, oh, it's not Miriam. I wanted to be predictable because I know it's what trust Mm takes. And the thing is to point them to you can operate predictably as opposed to control predictability. Like you can't, yes. you can't wish the world to be less chaotic, but you can prepare, you can have a way that you address and approach the chaos. I feel like they invert that a lot of times and it creates a lot of frustration. 100%. And then I think it's, it's also a personality type. If you, I think if you thrive in this unpredictability where creativity, innovation, mm-hmm. agility are needed, mm-hmm. You do need these frameworks. And that's what I mean with predictability in terms of structures, frameworks, rules. Because if you have to adjust to a constantly changing environment, competitive system, technology, you want to reduce the stress around those things that shouldn't change. And these are, that's what I meant, the structure, the rituals, as you said. And then it's so relieving to know, okay, every Friday we do this, right. we come together, we are answering the same questions. It's like, right. And then I work with so many people who flip it. They get frustrated at the world for being chaotic. And then instead mm. of controlling the things they can control, they just think those will all work themselves out. And I'm like, no, 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 put your attention here. Build the operating system to be clear with your rituals, to be clear in your approach, to be consistent in how you show up. That actually sets your team up to go take on that chaos in a much better way. I love that. And it almost sounds as if it's the lizard brain taking over. Mm -hmm. 
being so stressed about the uncontrollable and then cramping or clinging yeah. on those few things they can control. I like that. But then it doesn't make sense. It's a stress response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you, when we, you work with managers who have, and I think that's a beautiful challenge, you're working with men, they're not new managers. No, they have been working with teams for five to 10 years and they come together. At least they do have the mindset that something needs to change. Mm -hmm. But also it's, as you said, the first intuition, the first instinct is still, oh, that's dangerous. If I'm seeking feedback, genuine feedback, if I'm telling someone that they made a mistake or give them candid feedback, that feels dangerous because it hasn't been rewarded in the past. What are the first things that you are training them in to build that confidence well, part of it is, yeah, I'll just pick on your words. It hasn't been rewarded in the past. But my question would be, has it been punished? And has it even been tried? Like a lot of times we'll say, oh, I haven't seen, you know, like you said, I haven't seen somebody get a gold star for this, so it must be bad. And I'm like, well, and, and in some cases, yes. Like you might see like, oh, I've got 10 different cases where this person, you know, where these all these people were punished for doing this thing. And I'd say like, okay, then maybe you're in the wrong place. But let's, in most cases, when you push it, they can't actually point to anyone being punished for that behavior because usually it is a productive behavior we're talking about. And then you say, well, well, tell me about all the people who've tried it. And either they tell you the people who tried it and you can sort of diagnose where they came up short. Maybe they tried it, but not in a good way. Maybe they missed a key step, et cetera. Or you come to realize that no one's actually tried it. And that opens the door. You know, The thing that I constantly encourage people to do is just don't make a permanent decision, make a temporary one. So if you want to you know, you want to change your team's cadence to have a Friday ritual on feedback. Don't declare that forever. Just say, guys, I'd love to run an experiment. For the month of June, four weeks, I have this belief that if we could come together and review the week, that we could solve problems faster, give everybody a couple hours of their week back because we'd be a more productive team. Y'all game to try that for the next month? And then at the end of the month, we'll, we'll step back and say, was that better or worse than the old way we did it? And here's how we'll evaluate it. And the idea of it being like people push back less if it's something that's not forever. And so they'll embrace it more of like, oh, I guess I could try it for a month. Like what's a month? And you're having now a conversation about, well, what does success look like? How will we judge it? What will it look like? So you went from good idea, bad idea to how do we make the good idea work? Um, and so that's, it just seems like a simple trick, but you sort of work through, take away the fear, acknowledge the reality that no one's actually tried it, and then make it a very small experiment you usually will get them to buy in. And again, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but it's better than doing exactly the same thing and expecting a different result. I love that on so many levels. <laughs> it's so evidence-based. It's tell me when you try it and what, and then decomposing it and looking at it. Okay. And what, it's exactly, it follows the same pattern that you described for the team review at the end is, okay, let's decompose it. And where did it fail? If you have actually tried it, at what stage did it fail? <laughs> and was it really because of you or was it because of the process? And then you can work on it. And I think this as such already builds confidence mm -hmm. for the person because they realize, oh, it's not me. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad manager. It's um, something small yeah. that one can change. You are making the right connection. At some level, I'm a one trick pony. It's just a pretty good trick. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it... Um, predictable, but in a, in a good way that it gives structure. And within this structure, many things can happen. And it's, it's simple. It's not easy. It's well said. And that's, again, what many people get wrong. It is. I mean, and again, we, I was joking about being like coaching other people around and falling in my own hole. You know, if you rewind to the beginning of our conversation, right, have a great picture of what excellent looks like, which we've talked about how you can increase the aperture of that. Have a very clear eyed view of where you are. And then cleverly pick the ways to go from here to there. If you asked me to give you the perfect articulation of my business, what excellent looks like, I still struggle to do it. You know, and so it is, it's very easy to say that it's hard to do, but that's where the value is, right? The hard things are what will probably be most unlocking, even if they're very simple to understand. Yeah. I recently read this um, quote, you will always get what you need once you know what you need. Because most of the time, it's really, it's the most difficult to really articulate what we need. Mm -hmm. 
and to know what it is. Why do you think that is? I think because several things. I think, A, it's difficult to really envision what we want and then to be that vulnerable and honest to ourselves what it is, what we need for that. I'm reading the book of um, nonviolent communication, Mm -hmm. and it boils down to something similar, that we fail to communicate nonviolently with each other because we fail to say what we need in very precise ways. I need you to, to respect me. Okay. But how do you know that? How would I know that you respect me? And these are, it's very difficult to say that. And I often work with uh, this example with groups when we work on psychological safety. How do you know that someone respects you? If you have ever thought about it, it's okay. When you listen to me, when you ask me questions, when you look me in the eye. So what do I need to feel respected? What do I need to feel successful? What do I need to celebrate a win? Mm-hmm. Um, I think these questions go very deep, actually, and it's then difficult. My, I mean, I'm, I'm still working through my own version of this. So I'm trying to figure it out for myself. So it's a bit of a selfish question. One of the things my, my wife and I take a lot of walks, and that's where a lot of our meetings happen. You know, we'll talk about we're generally very agreeable, you know, at some level. Like, I think I have worked with people who are very disagreeable who for the people for whom nothing is good enough. And I think one of the benefits that they have is an increasingly small, well, this is what good looks like. It's very sharp. And therefore, that's why everything doesn't fit it. Versus I can tell myself five interesting stories. Well, the business could be, oh, we can, well, you're doing speaking. Like, wouldn't it be cool when the kids go to college to go to a couple different cool locations a month and do speaking and be paid for that and travel with your wife. And wouldn't that be a lovely life? I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool. Oh, but what if you recorded your courses and mostly got paid for not even having to do anything other than recording a couple courses a year and the business just ran itself? Like, wouldn't that be lovely? You could, you have the sovereignty both financially and with your time to do whatever it is you want. I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. Oh, but you love to write. And so what if... You know, and I can paint for myself five pictures and then people are like, well, and I know this. I'm like, I really have a hard time optimizing, I ha- like optimizing my days because I'm leaving all these options on the table. And yet I struggle to pick. I struggle to sort of look three, five, seven, 10 years in the future and say, that's the one I want and then back solve for it. And then the coaching question would be, what do you gain by not deciding? What do you gain by not deciding? Uh, I, I would probably say something like optionality, you know, which isn't the most amazing answer. But I, the way that I, ra- I can tell you how I rationalize it, I rationalize it because a lot of the pieces down each of those paths, and there's a couple more, a lot of the early pieces are roughly the same. So I feel like I don't actually have to decide. That's how I rationalize it. But I know that there's micro choices that would be clearer if I did. And there, and, mm. and if we go back to the compound, again, this is like the cobbler's children have no shoes. I know the power of compounding. I know the sooner I make that choice, the sooner those micro choices start to add up and compound and would accelerate me down any one of those paths versus slowing me on some of the, you know, sort of diffusing them across a series of them, even if they are related, like they're in the same quadrant. They're probably not on the exact same mm-hmm. path, but they are, they're not, very few of them are 180 degrees the other direction. So I can totally relate to what you said. It, oh, there are all these options. Mm-hmm. And I think everything that you can imagine, you can a- achieve. I truly believe that because then you know what you need and then you can get what you need. And then for me, not deciding is um, sometimes I have the impression that if I made an exact plan and I structured the strategy towards it, then it solely becomes a ticking the box activity. Mm -hmm. And this feels like a day job and I haven't signed up for (laughs) for an entrepreneurial career to tick boxes and follow a path. Even if I have designed and decided on that path, then it's, I'm telling myself what to do. That's really boring. So I have this, I have a little bit of that too, but then aren't we back to doing the thing we were just talking about we shouldn't be doing, which is we're sort of allowing the chaos of the system we should be building to go after the chaos we're chasing. We're just using our desire to be 
independent, free-floating, solo entrepreneurs, and therefore we shouldn't have all these constraints, even though we know the constraints might fuel us towards our purpose. Yeah. And then it depends on the goal. On the goal. So what if know, what if we would call ourselves artists? This is where I get stuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what if we would call ourselves artists mm -hmm. and the process of building something is actually the goal? That's true. And then suddenly it's, I think as long, and that's where I get then stuck, I need to remind myself, as long as I don't get into this stress mode mm -hmm. and then get stressed because I have created so much chaos around me that I forgot about the processes. <laughs> and that's why I am very clear and strict on these are my rules, these are my processes. That's how I operate because <laughs> then chaos can happen within that. Mm -hmm. And that's fun, but I always can fall back into. I like that. Yeah. The other one I've been thinking about is the idea of seasons. You know, that mm. there, there will be moments, there'll be different seasons where the process, the steps, the consistency has to show up. So as an example, an early season for me was I didn't exist on social media. I just use social media to track the news and like see what was going on with friends and family. I didn't post, I didn't like, I didn't engage. And then when I started realizing that was an important input to our business, it was actually critical for me to be consistent, right? You could sort of see the way that the algorithms would reward creators who showed up every single day versus people who showed up whenever they wanted. I could see the quality of my writing improving faster if I showed up every day than whenever the muse showed up. But now, you know, but then you play it ahead and say, well, is this maybe the business or my art in your frame has entered a new season. And so maybe now I mm -hmm. need to find a different way to achieve that consistency so I can put my attention into building like the next stage of the factory or embracing the new season. So that's the other thing I've been thinking about a bit is maybe I maybe my problem isn't deciding exactly the right place to go. Maybe I'm just not acknowledging the, the new season. Yes, I love that. And it reminds me what you said earlier about the managers. You don't have to decide forever. Mm -hmm. Make an experiment for the next four months and see what happens. And then it's almost a gamified process where, okay, if you... Once you master that skill, oh, now you have reached your, what, 20,000 followers? Okay, so it's now it's time to enter the new season and experiment on something different mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So now you're telling me I've played the game 10 times too long. All right. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Definitely a gain in that. One question that I enjoy asking is, uh, what's your number one facilitation challenge? I feel like there was one I had that I've gotten better at, which is how do you get to trust remotely faster, mm -hmm. right? Like whether I'm coaching or we're doing it with our group, it's like, how do you take a someone who, even if they are watching you on podcasts, reading, they feel like they know you a little bit, but that's different than trusting you. And so mm -hmm. how do you, you know, well, Mar and I will talk about it as like, how do you race to trust? Because we only have, especially with our program, we only have eight sessions over three and a half weeks. and The faster we get everybody onto this side of the trust category, the conversations get better, the learnings go up, the collaboration, the connection. It just it is the it's the hurdle we have to get over. And so we do all kinds of kooky things to do that. From we ask people their favorite hype song, and then we play that as the entry music sometimes. We ask more personal questions that are harmless, right? Your your first concert or your favorite food or whatever as ways to facilitate connection and tell very vulnerable stories about us in those contexts. Again, sort of showing the type of relationship we want to have at scale. So I feel like that was one for us for a while. I think we figured out how to do some of that. I think the new one is a, it's a derivative of that. So many times we'll be brought into a company now. And sometimes it's through our standard program. And if it's that, I know how to do it. But sometimes it's a, hey, can you come in and engage on this specific problem? Like I'm thinking of a, I've been brought into a couple different organizations over the last few months to diagnose a specific problem. And I would say one of my challenges is I didn't have all the tricks to race to trust. And we're being brought in very much like, please bring your expertise to bear on this solving this problem. And again, like I said, I have one trick, but it's a good trick, which is we're trying to diagnose to the root cause of who should do what differently. Okay, but. So now we're going from, here's a stranger, and in an hour or so, we're going to try to leave the room. 
with enough trust that we can all agree in front of our peers and sometimes our boss of how we screwed up and what we're going to do differently. Mm-hmm. And so I, ha- I don't know. And again, a lot of times we're doing this remotely. And so I don't know that I have fully cracked getting to that same level of trust and being able to go that much further in terms of what the outcome is in an hour. So that's my current biggest facilitation challenge. Beautiful one. What do you got for me? You have any, <laughs> how do we, how do I solve that? <laughs> <laughs> if only I knew I, um, there are a few ideas that come to my mind right. and I think it, one might be, do you really need trust or is psychological safety maybe enough? Okay. Because trust is, as you said, it's built through interactions mm-hmm. and rewards and it's a personal connection and relationship between two people. Whereas psychological safety is more of a group norm. So you feel safe enough to act or to say something in a specific environment. Okay. And for that, you don't need the one-on-one trust. Okay. Necessarily. What, what um, so I think like, this- what's my five minute blueprint? Like if, if I had to go from zero to psychological safety in the first five minutes, because I only have an hour, what, what, would, what would I do? Make sure that everyone knows why they're there. So purpose. Okay. And be sure that everyone knows why them personally are there. So role and purpose, feeling welcomed and feeling heard immediately. So that not only they have a reason to be there, but you're interested in what they're saying. And then rewarding. So giving them the opportunity to use their vocal cords Mm -hmm. as soon as possible and rewarding this positively, whatever they have said. Okay. That's helpful. I might, I think if I'm looking at my blueprint, I think I, maybe I need to find a way to pull forward the last piece. I think the rest I do well. I think we try to set that context. Here's the outcomes. Here's why you're here, et cetera. And we try to draw them out a little. I think the challenge is how do I get like literally in the last two, I had 11 and 15 people in the room. And so how do I do that in a way that is, you know, like you said, getting them in the, and I can use the chat. I try to use the chat a little bit. That's like a, a variant of their vocal cords, but I don't think it's as personal. It's not as personal. What I recently did, it was a a leadership team of 11 and it was a challenging task as well. We only had two hours and I asked them to check in. So to state just one word of their intention for the call. And I was very clear that I'm asking for your attention. I'm not asking for your expectation because your expectation is on all the others to meet your expectation. Intention is how you will show up to achieve the goal that you showed up with here for. They looked at me and then they started with their one word or one sentence intention. And then there was one who formulated as an expectation. I want uh, that everyone does whatever. And I paused for a second. I didn't say anything. And then someone else of the group said, wouldn't this be an expectation instead of an intention? I was like, thank you. Would you like to reframe your expectation to be an intention? And this already, especially with um, leaders, to give them the responsibility that they're in charge of, to create the experience or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think this was a, a nice trick um, like to that. break them. Thank you. And then small groups, breaking them up into breakout rooms. Mm. Yeah, we do that. Because I think especially when working with a team where there's not a lot of trust or psychological safety, it's very daring, especially online, to raise your hand and say something without having had the chance to double check whether what you're about to say is really stupid. Mm -hmm. And then to have the chance to test it in a smaller group, to have the side chat and then come back and share it. This really also makes a difference. Cool. All right. I'll give a couple of those a shot. Thank you. Yeah. What makes a workshop fail for you? What makes a workshop fail for me? (laughs) I was going to make a joke. I was going to say not having it. I'm being tongue in cheek, but I sort of mean it, which is I don't, I think that there are like, well, I'll talk about it a lot. Like I come on a podcast or we teach or we speak. And there's this, there's almost these two modes. One mode is like very intellectual. It's very, um, it's when things feel mechanical. And then mm-hmm. the other one we'll talk about is the trance. You're like, I'm saying these words. I've never said those words before. They're kind of better than the words I've said before. 
it's sort of like you're looking down on yourself and, and you know, call it the zone or flow or whatever else. And so I'm joking in that I know when I'm in one of those two modes. Like I, I, I'm, I'm getting very cognizant of it. I don't, I don't necessarily know how to flip it on. I would like to figure that out next because I would obviously want to turn it on all the time. But I really do believe, you know, I, even one of those ones we were just talking about, I ran last week. At some level, I could say that that was a total failure. Like we did not leave the room with like very clear next steps of who's going to do what differently. But in the process of facilitating that, we uncovered way bigger problems than the one we walked in the room to do. And so I'm like, well, is that a failure? I didn't do the very narrow thing I said I was going to do. And I can, I can take that. I would, I would own that. Wow. I think we found way more interesting things to go spend time on and explore and uncover and fix. And if we do that, it's going to make solving that problem seem. Moot. And so to some degree, I'm like, I think that was pretty good. And so the reason I said not having it is, well, if it goes badly, I learn from that. And then I do better next time. If it goes well, I learn from that and I repeat it next time. And so the only one I truly fail on is the one we don't have. I don't get any data mm. about whether it was right or was wrong, effective, ineffective. So I think that's the big, like that's, that's how I tend to think about failure. Failure are the things I don't do, not things I do that go wrong. I love that. And I think if you, yeah, if you prepare it well, and as you said, you always make sure that the people gather around a clear purpose and know why they are there. And if you have the right people for the right reason in the room, mm -hmm. they can only be learning. Yeah. And like you said earlier, I can't control the outcome necessarily. Mm -hmm. I can try. I can try to prepare and, and go through a process that gets an excellent outcome. Sometimes I'll do that brilliantly and we still won't get there. Sometimes I'll do my work poorly and we'll get lucky. You know, and so that's why I mostly try to focus on the things that I can control. I can't make the executives I work with get better. I can do all, of, I can do everything I want to, I can possible to try to help that be true. But they, at the end of the day, have to make, do the work, make the changes, shift their mindsets, et cetera. Um, same with the groups. Yeah. And so. And I think if, if we're going into a space and then push our process through no matter what, being almost blind to all the signs of what else could be more important, then we're doing a disservice to the group. Because at the end, I wonder whether failure or are we committed to achieve the goal that we, that we promised a client? Or are we in service of the group and help them? Because at the end, they could fill in the checklist. Okay, so who needs to do what better mm -hmm. next time yep. and totally ignore maybe some underlying conflict or something that's went wrong in the first place. Yep. And then it seems like, oh, we went through it. We filled in the table, but maybe afterwards uh, the team is in a big conflict because uh, as soon as you leave, they're finger pointing towards each other and blaming for uh, all the mistakes they've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This would be a failure. Check the box versus change the minds. Yeah, totally. And I wonder when you explained, and I can totally relate to that, the either you are following the script and you're doing what you always do, and it's almost as if you can observe yourself doing that mm -hmm. versus being in the flow and becoming the best version of yourself and saying things you've never said before. Can you pinpoint What impacts one state versus the other? I wish I could. I wish I could more precisely. I do find some pieces. We were joking before we got on about me just getting off the Peloton. I do find that mm -hmm. if I do something high intensity, go for a run, jump on the bike, lift weights, etc., it is more likely to be found. Um, I, I definitely see the correlation between those things. I feel similarly about sleep, that if I sleep, It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be, you know, blackout shades, eight hours, 10 to 6 a.m. Uh, but if I sleep pretty well, that usually increases the odds of it happening. But it's not quite as, it's still not something where I can manufacture it on demand. Um, there will be times I'll mm. have all those ingredients and it just won't come. There will be times I'll miss some of those ingredients and it magically shows up. So I, I, I don't know. Because I was wondering... Linked to our conversation before with it has to do with our own psychological safety? I don't think for me, honestly. 
that flow state shows up in a wide range of environments, some of which would be unobjectively not safe. <laughs> mm. So maybe there's a world where I have spent enough time in enough unsafe environments that it doesn't really impact me anymore. Hmm. Can you give an example? I'm curious. Well, I think if you, I, I mean, I can pick on Bridgewater, right? At some level, that same formula I laid out would say, oh, we have everyone who's mission aligned. We have really clear operating principles. We have these rituals and we follow them. But pick any group of 2,000 people, right? I'm going to have the full distribution of people who understand and implement that operating system with good intentions versus bad intentions, with finesse or with chaos. And so I certainly, and I probably created this for other people at certain points. Like I had been in diagnosis sessions run by someone who was not creating a safe environment, who was like using the facilitation that they were doing anyways, to like be emotional or to bully all kinds of different things. But I was saying over 10 years of being in an organization where I got 11,000 pieces of feedback from, you know, some of the most impressive minds in the world, at least are in the financial world. I don't know, like getting up in front of a couple hundred people is not a big deal. You know, that's why, like, I think for me, it may be true for others, but I don't, I don't feel particularly unsafe in most environments. I mean, your heart still picks up a little bit when you walk on a stage, but I don't know. What's the worst that happens? I don't get invited back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. And yeah, I was wondering because for me personally, I think if I have the impression that the process is not held strongly or if there's toxicity in the group, then I become self-conscious. And then I cannot, it's more difficult to get into the flow state. Even as a facilitator or only when you're part of that core group? When I'm a facilitator. Interesting. Yeah. I could see that. And I think I became better in just creating then the safety for myself. Yeah. So for instance, I have calls with all the participants before I host a workshop. I jump on 15 minutes calls with them mm -hmm. to have a little chat and understand where they're coming from. And this also helps me to prepare, helps to build rapport, and helps me to build my psychological safety once I step in. We do something similar. I mean, we usually just do the, the ends. We basically say, like, whoever the principal of the meeting is, we want to meet with them. And then we'll ask them for two people. Like, who is the mm -hmm. star, the champion, the positive? Pro give, me the, give me the person who's going to be my biggest ally in the room. And then give me your biggest problem child. Like, give me the one who's going to mm. blow it up, who's going to be dissenting. I just want to get to know, I want to know the range of what I'm dealing with. And like you said, if I can enter the room, ideally with both of them on my side, you're at least connected enough. It usually sort of shrinks the possibility of like what, what could happen. Um, mm. So we do something similar. Yeah. What is your guess? Because in every team, there's always the problem maker, right? The sure. problem child. What do you think makes them the problem child and what's the trick to get them on your side? <laughs> this might sound crazy. The majority of the time they're right. And I, th so I think the reason they're the problem child is they're not heard. And then, and then you're like, well, why aren't they heard? A lot of times they lack finesse. A lot of times they're a jerk. A lot of times they um, are missing something. There's lots of different reasons why someone, but it's, I'm shocked by the number of times everyone is warning me about this person And I've seen the character before. And I'm like, that person's not that hard to deal with. They're just like missing. You're allowing one capability to overshadow all the goodness they're bringing to the table. And I'm setting aside, like, there are people who are truly like toxic. I'm not talking about them. And they're hard to deal with too. But for the most part, most good organizations expunge the toxic people. That's why I'm like, there's just people who are like a step removed from that, who are just difficult. And it's, what's interesting is a lot of times they know they're difficult. And they, be, they come to believe that the difficulty is an asset, not a liability. And so the way that we deal with it is, one, try to hear them, like genuinely try to hear them. The trick for that is just to say back to them what they're saying. It never happens anymore because they're a jerk. No one does it anymore. And so you just summarizing mm. back, like, oh, I, let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. You're saying A, B, and C. Is that, am I summarizing accurately? Like, was that how you would say it? And they'll be like, no, 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 you totally missed C. I'm like, okay, so A and B are good. Let's just talk about C. And then you go through C and then you say back C. I'm like, okay, gotcha. So like, if we could leave the facilitation with like A, B and C being true, like that would, that, and they'll say something like, that would be like no meeting I'd ever been in before. And you're like, okay, cool. I got, that's great. Will you help me do that? Like, here's what I need from you. 
you yeah. know? And I, so I think that idea of hearing them, really showing them you heard them and then pulling them over to your side to say like, okay, now you and I are going to win together, right? We're going to go make this happen. You know, I can't promise you B. B is like something you're going to have to decide as the group. But I think, you know, A and C seem like totally doable inside of this. And they're usually very reasonable then. But people have stopped being reasonable with them. And so now they've decided they can't be, re- if they if they become reasonable, they give up ground. They like lack integrity. They stop shining a light on the really important thing no one's listening to anymore. So that's that's been my trick for the most part. And it relates back to something we talked about before, the, making the implicit explicit and being very rigorous to state what, what it is that they need. What are the metrics that they will yes. measure success upon? Mm-hmm. It's sh- like we do it in all of, the, all of my different formats. Uh, the very first session is we just agree on expectations and it's their expectation. It's not mine. Like I will ask them if we're, if we are 12 out of 10 successful, like the best version you could possibly imagine. And then two notches above that, what's it look like? Like what is true in six months and nine months and 12 months, like whatever horizons authentic to you, but tell me that story. Okay. Now how do we, now how do we get there? And I have the impression this is the most difficult conversation to have. Yeah. We don't have to get too locked into it, right? Like they, like I did 30 minutes ago, realize it's difficult, but they'll say something, you know, or they'll at least give you the options. And so then mm-hmm. you can say, oh, so one of the things that might be a part of our success is if you move from having three possibilities down to the right one. And these two other problems you brought up, we've, we've in the process of sorting out which of these three, we've also closed these other problems. You know, like I'll, we'll work with CEOs and they'll say, oh, I really want this like competent leadership team so I can have a little bit more of my time back or I want to sell the company. I'm like, oh, okay. Those are relatively different things. But you start to then pull it apart, you know, and part of it's getting back their time. Part of it is they're not dealing well with a couple people on their leadership teams. You're like, well, if we can upgrade these two people, we'll give you back the time. And does that give you, is that enough? Or does that give you more data that says you should sell? Because even if you want to sell, having a better leadership team is going to make the sale easier and more valuable. Getting people to talk out loud through that visualization exercise usually gives you an awful lot of surface area. Beautiful. Yeah. And then I would like to come back to one more thing that you mentioned earlier, the, your experience at Bridgewater that when you lost the fear, so to speak. So yeah, sometimes there are people who, who are toxic and don't know how to create the safety in, in such feedback sessions. Mm-hmm. With what you know today about the coaching, the training, what would you advise them or where did it go wrong? And how can someone who then speaks up create um, the safety for themselves? Three questions. Well, I think where it went wrong to take that first so again, just to just to say it back, we're talking about someone facilitating one of these sessions and not doing the productive, open-minded, assertive coaching version of the process, but using it in ways that were more negative, right? Okay, yeah. so for those people facilitating, well, where did it go wrong? Again, we're starting to see some themes emerge. I guess that's one of the one of the upsides to a longer form podcast is the themes keep coming back. But one of them is, mm-hmm. in some cases, they didn't know what good looked like. Maybe they, you know, they hadn't seen the four minute mile, so they didn't know it was possible. Right. So they, or they had seen it, but not, you know, sometimes you watch things differently when you imagine yourself leading it versus when you're sort of experiencing it as a participant. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they had seen it, but not really seen it. That's one. There's training might go into that. So there's lots of places where, okay, so, but do they know what good looks like and how it could be facilitated in a better way? Have they been trained to do it? Then you get ending into, well, do they want to? Right. Like sometimes I can't make you be nice. I can't make you ask questions instead of lead with answers. Like you have to believe enough that the outcome will be better, that the tax of doing something that's not natural is worth paying. And so I think that's a lot of the place where we were talking about being honest with yourself earlier. I think a lot of the people who are creating these environments, like forget these sessions in general, are basically saying the tax that they have to pay to make the change is higher than the benefit that they perceive that they will get for doing it. And so I think that's, if, if I were coaching people to say, they go stare back at your teams or your organizations, you know, is that true? 
like, well, or, or even how could that be true? Well, it could be true because the layer above who's setting the culture, the leaders of the organization are not imposing an offsetting tax for people being jerks. <laughs> right. So if it's like, oh, we re- um, and in some cases they reward them. And so you're getting this this feedback cycle that says, "Ooh, drive really hard, burn people out, be a big jerk, deliver. But you delivered your stuff mm-hmm. through that heroics. Yeah. I think one of the um, a pattern I see across all the hyper a lot of the high performing orgs I'm with. And I don't I haven't figured out how to solve it is this idea that I shorthand it with them as we only throw parades for heroes. It's only firefighters that are in the Memorial Day parade coming up next weekend. It's not the people who prevented fires. Preventing fires is unsexy. It's not cool at all. But if you think about building a sustainable business through time, you want people who prevent fires, not people who can just put them out. But how do we get to a world where we celebrate the fire preventers? And Because you will never see it. Well, right. You don't, it's the invisible work, actually. Yes. And to some degree, you don't want to punish the firefighters. Because occasionally things will go chaotic and you want people to jump in and be heroes and blur the lines and solve problems. But the more that we celebrate it, the more than people say, oh, that's how I get noticed. That's what I have to do. And so I leave chaos uncontrolled so that occasionally I can pitch in and put out the fire. And like you get into this very vicious cycle. Can I just end that for one second? Sure. It reminds me of, so I studied behavior economics and there were all these um, experiments run in organizations. and pointing out how difficult it is to implement a reward and bonus system in organizations to incentivize the right behavior that you want to see. And one example was the one colleague who would bring a cake to the office every Friday. That's something that is beautiful and it's intrinsically motivated. If at one point you think, oh, this is something that we want to see more of, And say, okay, we have a bonus or a medal or some badge for people who bring a cake to the office. Then suddenly you have all these badge seekers Mm -hmm. who would bake a cake and the person who was actually intrinsically motivated would stop baking the cake because they don't want to be seen as someone who's seeking the badge. And I think that's the problem with the firefighters, that how can you build an incentive system in an organization that rewards those who are taking the small actions to keep everything on track without attracting those who are just after the bad. I think you just defined one of our biggest challenges. Mm. You can have a very big business if you have the answer. Interesting one. A conversation to be continued. Fair enough. Thank you. And I interrupted the last question about the jerks. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Was when you are in the situation where it doesn't feel safe, so what can you do to protect yourself? I'm pausing because I have three different answers. I'm just wondering, I'm like, what's the right order? My short version of it was going to be leave, get over it, and speak up. It, it sort of depends on the degree of how unsafe you feel over what sort of level of persistence, right? If you feel pervasively unsafe, just leave. Like life's too short. Even at a mid-level or senior level manager, your ability to like transform an organization where where it is just lack of safety everywhere. And again, maybe it's unsafe or maybe it feels unsafe because you're so not aligned to like the mission and the behaviors expected in that organization. It almost doesn't matter which answer it is because the outcome is the same, which is like, go find a place where you are aligned. Go find a place where they are creating the safety that is authentic. So that's the leave part. The speak up part is, again, to me, that's just the same transformation of the implicit to explicit. A lot of times we are doing things we don't necessarily have bad intentions. Like I think 98% of people have good intentions, poorly executed. And so the only way that they're going to execute differently is if we speak up, you can do it through questions. You can do it through, you know, nonviolent statements, however you want to do it. But the more that we convert our secret expectations, which is really all that's happening. If someone is well-intentioned and delivering an environment that you don't feel safe, There is a secret expectation on one side or the other. And the only way I know to get rid of secret expectations is to talk and to make them explicit. That's why I'd say, find a way to speak up. And again, you can be respectful. You can ask questions, lots of versions of that, but that is the next. And then the last one, which is not going to be very popular for me to put safety and get over it in the same sentence. I have this belief that we're taking these statements that are pretty clear and clinically defined. And then we are extrapolating them to be bigger than they were intended. 
So it might be things like imposter syndrome or burnout or psychological safety. And so imagining it's not truly unsafe, imagining you've spoken up and you've tried to align on safety. The reason I say get over it is like, sometimes things are hard. Like, in Mm -hmm. fact, the best things are hard. It's supposed to be hard. Like it's what makes you stronger. It is like what growth feels like. It is what doing challenging work with smart people feels like. And so you are not always going to feel comfortable. And so I'm sort of, I try to take the truly non-safe people out of the mix and say, are you sure you don't feel safe or do you just feel a little uncomfortable? In which case, like, that's okay. Like get over it and keep going. Important distinction. Yeah. Safety and comfort. Right. And I think we, again, we keep extending these which is actually diminishing the places where it's actually missing, you know, and it's confusing the issue. Yeah. And I think actually you need the safety to feel uncomfortable because as you said, it's the discomfort that helps us grow, but we shouldn't feel unsafe because then we cannot focus on growth. We're in the fear zone. Yeah. Yeah. I got into a, there was a back and forth I had with, I, I did a post on, I think it was on Twitter X, whatever we're calling it these days. And I made some comment about like the sources of burnout and someone chimed in to, to say, you know, well, burnout's a clinical, you know, like there's a truly a hormonal change that will shut somebody down, et cetera. And it was basically telling my, my post was wrong. And then I, the question I followed up with was like, awesome. Thank you. How many of the people who you th- hear in day-to-day conversations saying they have burnout meet the clinical definition you just told me about? And he was like, oh, like less than 10%. And I'm like, I know. And that that was honestly the point of my whole post, which is we've blown it up to be these other things that it's not. Like, yes, mm-hmm. if we can keep it here, then that's an important thing for us to have language for and to deal with and to embrace and, and support people through. When we extend it to be all these other things, we actually mask this important corner and just sort of confuse the issue. And I, I do feel similar with a number of these issues. Good point. And that's why I like the distinction that has appeared now with the small T and capital T trauma, because suddenly everyone was talking about their trauma. And now there's a clear distinction. Okay, there's small T trauma. We all have it. We all weren't hurt when we cried as a baby. Yes. There's also another sort of trauma. Let's not confuse the two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And with the burnout. Yeah. True. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for having me. This was amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for this open, deep conversation. Uh, the time flew. I unfortunately have to go facilitate a conversation. Or no, I should say I fortunately get to go facilitate a conversation. It's unfortunate yeah. that we have to wrap up, but it is uh, fortunate yeah. that I get to be a partner to all these folks. Absolutely. Lucky group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end. I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I am devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.org slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week.